Hi, my name is Rafe Mobs. I'm a neurosurgeon at Prince of Wales and my interest area is in spine surgery. Now if you're watching this video, it's likely that you or a family member uh, is considering having a so-called ALIF procedure performed. So that's an anterior lumbar interbody fusion. This procedure is used to treat one of the many degenerative changes that affects the spine and in the video today we'll be going through the many aspects of it. Firstly, some of the reasons of why you may be having the procedure or why you may be considering the procedure. Secondly, the technical aspects and lastly, some of the rehabilitation options that, uh, that would be suitable for you after your surgery. Okay, so let's have a look at the spine in a bit more detail. So your spine is made up of about 25 or so bones, from your head to your pelvis. Now, for this procedure, we're focusing on the lower aspect of the spine, the so-called lumbar area. So the lumbar area is the five last bones of the spine, and in between the bones, there is separated by a disc, and the disc is the cushioning device. It not only provides our spine stability, provides our spine movement, and it also provides protection for the underlying nerves, the spinal canal and the spinal nerves. So let's have a look at a joint in a bit more detail. So here we have two bones of the spine separated by a disc. This is the front view of the spine. The back view of the spine we can see that there are these small stabilizing joints and we call these facet joints. So for every one joint in the spine it's actually made up of three articulations. But let's now focus on this articulation, the disc, the cushion. We can see that the cushion is made up of two very separate areas. The outer part of the disc, called the annulus, and the inner part of the disc, or the cushioning part of your disc, which is called the nucleus. This provides strength and stability. This provides a bit of cushioning or bounce for your spine. Now this is a normal appearing spinal joint. Let's have a look to see what happens to the spine with the wear and tear cascade over many years. Okay, so starting with a normal spine joint, let's just see what happens over time when the spine degenerates. So, with the healthy spine, we can see that the disc is tall. The height of the disc provides a height between the bones so that the spinal nerves have plenty of room to escape from the spine, to run down your legs and look after the sensation and the movement. So this is normal. In the early stages of the wear and tear cascade, the first thing that happens is that the spine starts to lose some of its height. The joints at the back of the spine, called the facet joints, also start to wear out a, a little, but the primary problem is that the disc, including both the annulus and the nucleus, do start to have wear and tear changes, and alas, this happens to all of us as we age. As the degenerative cascade moves further down the track, we can see that the disc has lost further height. We can see that the disc may start to bulge and may start to impinge on the spinal nerves or the central canal where the spinal uh, cord runs. Now as the disc wears out even further, we can see that there is now fairly advanced loss of height of the disc. We can see this lipping of bone that we call osteophytes. We can see that the joints at the back of the spine have become markedly, markedly worn out. And importantly, we can see that the nerves that exit the spine have become quite severely compressed. We call this phenomenon foraminal stenosis. So, starting from a normal spine to a worn out spine, the disc has degenerated and shrunk. The hole for the nerves has altered significantly causing nerve impingement, therefore pain down the legs, and also the joints at the back of the spine called the facet joints also undergo significant wear and tear changes. There can be further problems where the bones start to slip one on top of another, and we call this a spondylolisthesis, or where the bones start to angulate in the side to side fashion, and we call this a scoliosis. So no spine degenerates the same, and with the process of the degeneration, it not only causes mechanical problems with the joints, but also neurological problems with the nerves. Okay, so as we just saw, from a normal spine to a very degenerate spine, that there has been considerable loss of height in the disc, also causing impingement of the nerves in the spine. And one of the ways that we can address this wear and tear phenomenon is by performing a so-called anterior interbody fusion. 
So here is one of the devices that we, that we place. And as you can see from these models, that one of the primary problems is that the height of the disc is lost over time. And we restore this height by inserting an implant such as this. Now this is a view of the front of the spine and of course to implant this device we need to have access to the front of the spine. Here is an MRI scan of a 73 year old male who presents with back and leg pain. The upper three discs are in relatively good health while the lower two discs demonstrate severe degeneration. This is the cause of his pain problems. An overlay of the post-operative x-ray shows the position of the disc implants. These stabilise the worn out discs, helping alleviate the degenerative mechanical back pain. They also restore the height of the discs to open the foramen or the holes at the side of the spine where the nerves exit. This assists with relief of the nerve pain down the legs. I'm Andrew Lennox. I'm a vascular surgeon. I operate with Dr. Mobs as part of the approach team uh, for the anterior lumbar interbody fusion procedures. Uh, I'm involved in these procedures because the lumbar spine sits directly behind the major blood vessels in the abdomen. The main artery, the aorta, and the iliac vessels that come from the aorta sit directly over the operative site of the degenerate lumbar disc. Also, the inferior vena cava and the iliac veins are the main venous supply draining blood from the legs back to the heart. Now, those vessels sit here directly in front of the lumbar spine and as part of the approach, we need to retract these vessels safely away from the spine in order to get access to the disc space. This is done as an anterior approach or approach through the middle of the tummy uh, and uh, the intestinal cavity is retracted to the side in order to come down directly onto these vessels and the lumbar spine. So I will see you and assess you prior to the operation and get some history regarding the presence of any arterial disease in the lower limbs or any previous blood clots in the veins as this may impart the various risks associated with this procedure. Also, I will need to know if you've had any previous abdominal surgery as this may cause excessive scar tissue and also affect the approach that we do. With all this information and after an assessment of, of, of your case, we will work out where to make the incision and we'll have a discussion regarding the nature and risks of this procedure. Your surgery may take several hours, then a period in recovery before returning to the ward. Following surgery, you will require somewhere between three to six days in hospital, depending on your age, level of fitness and health. Some patients may require a short stay in rehabilitation. For the first two weeks, you should take it easy with a few gentle walks every day with no bending or twisting with your low back. After two weeks, if your wound is healing well, water-based activities should commence with walking laps in the pool, gentle stretches and a hydrotherapy program. After six weeks, a physiotherapy program should commence with a focus on strengthening of your core muscles, range of motion exercises, and general body conditioning. The majority of patients are back to full activities after about three to six months. However, occasionally this can take longer. As a final word, surgery is not without risk. You should weigh up the pros and cons of surgery before making any decision on any surgical or interventional procedure. This includes a discussion with your surgeon about these risks and about your symptoms and whether or not they are severe enough to warrant something as invasive as surgery. So I hope that this, uh, this video has been a help with your understanding of the procedure and all the best. Bye now.